It's a very, very great joy for my wife Margaret and myself to be back with you this evening. It's our first meeting since we returned on Wednesday afternoon from Africa, from the scenes of gracious and great visitations of the Holy Spirit on the African field. I told my brother that I would exercise great restraint and not deviate uh, to speak about uh, things uh, in Africa. <clears throat> there will be another time for that. But I'm so delighted to be here tonight to um, speak on God's behalf concerning the work of grace that He wrought in my life 50 years ago as a very much younger man. I'd like to preface my remarks tonight by reading just a verse or two. Uh, I'd prefer you didn't turn to it because by the time you've turned to it, I will have them read. I'm reading from John chapter 9. It's part of a great story about a wonderful miracle of healing that Jesus performed. In the verse number 10, we uh, have the question uh, put to the man who was healed, the man who had been blind from birth. How? were thine eyes opened? In fact, there were other questions put to him too, uh, like the one in verse number 26. What did he to thee? And again, how opened he thine eyes? And the man made this answer, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. It's interesting to remark that the man who gave that testimony, he was very much alone in the giving of that testimony. There were many in the gathering or the crowd that refused to believe, even though the miracle was so stark and so striking, very few were prepared to believe or accept, uh, largely because of the fear of the scribes and the Pharisees, the professional religionists of the day. And even his parents who were in the gathering, they also were afraid to stand up for their own flesh and blood and say, yes, hallelujah, this man is our son. And uh, he met Jesus a little while ago, and his life and our lives have been transformed. We can contain our joy. They should have been talking like that, but they were afraid. <laughs> they said, we don't know. He's of age. Ask him yourselves and let him speak. I want to answer that question this evening in regard to how the Lord Jesus opened mine eyes. I want you to know uh, tonight that because of the grace of God, I am not the person I used to be. I am not the person that I once was. My mother is still alive, and if she were here tonight, I could look in her direction and ask her to verify the story, the, the testimony, the record that I bear here in this house. And she would put her hand up and she would say, yes, what um, Gilbert is saying is absolutely true. And I'm very conscious tonight as I stand here, I'm giving my testimony before three worlds. I'm giving my testimony before heaven and the great uh, uh, gathering of angels that are unfallen and that are deeply interested in what goes on in this world and in the very presence of God. I'm giving my testimony also before the very demons of hell. They're not in the house because we've prayed and we've covered this place with the blood of Calvary, but they're listening. They're listening at the hedges and in the sides of the river. I'm sure, I'm sure they're interested in what's going on in this house. But alas, many, many of the Lord's people even are not as conscious of the spiritual warfare that rages on every side of us and in church ministry and work these days. 
we may not be living in denial of the devil, but uh, we, we are not taking uh, his presence and his activity seriously. And I'm also giving my testimony before this congregation and indeed before the world. And I want you to know tonight that I'm dealing with certainties. I'm dealing with absolutes. That I met Jesus one day and that my life has been completely and absolutely transformed. I say that is a certainty 50 years ago that my sins were forgiven, and they were many, I want you to know that that is an absolute certainty. That my name has been written in the book of life, I'm absolutely 100% sure of that fact. That I have got eternal life, that is an absolute, insofar as my experience is concerned. I know that I'm a child of God, and I know that my journey will end in that beautiful fair Eden above. I know that for sure. I deal in certainties. There was a day in my life when I was baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. That is a certainty. And it's because of that that I'm here tonight and that I'm serving God in Africa and seeing his power manifested there. That is a certainty. I don't care what terminology you want to use to explain what happened in my life. But uh, I want you to know that that is part of my experience. There was a day in my life when God touched me miraculously, and I was instantly healed from an incurable ailment. The doctor said, you live with this the rest of your life. Sorry, go home. You'll have to put up with it. God touched me. If I have time, I'd like to talk about that momentarily a little later on. And the call of God in my life, it came... In the month of May, uh, 1969, kneeling beside an old uh, Rayburn stove in our farmhouse kitchen, God spoke to me in the same manner as he spoke to Abraham, in the same ma manner as he spoke to the Apostle Paul, in the same manner as he spoke to Spurgeon, Wesley, and Moody, and so many others God spoke into my life. And that's why I can face what ever weather or storms come in ministry because the call of God is on my life. I remember during a difficult patch in my ministry, I went around with a, resi a resignation letter in my pocket for three months. And why didn't I hand it in? Because I knew if I handed it in, I would be out of the will of God. I'm in the center of God's plan for my life. And the event I speak of did not happen any time recently. So I'm dealing here tonight in this pulpit and in your presence with absolutes. Whatever I say, I don't care who wants to challenge me or who wants to test me or question me on any aspect of what I have to say. I know it's absolutely 100% factual. I did want to make a brief remark in regard to the testimony of the man I've just alluded to from John chapter 9. In regard to testimony and the giving of testimony, I want you to know that a testimony is very personal. Very personal. There are no two testimonies that are identical. Every story is different. Our journey and the circumstances by which we made that journey take us to the same meeting point, and I'm talking about the foot of the cross and to the feet of Jesus. But the experience in terms of the details, are different. It's a personal, a very, very personal experience. Hence the story, when it's related, it's different from anybody else's. I want you to know also that um, in the giving of a testimony, it's very important to be absolutely accurate, absolutely honest. A young man was getting carried away with giving his testimony one time uh, in a big meeting until his mother jumped up on the back row and she said, Johnny, remember, I am here. <laughs> he was saying things that weren't true. So she was calling him to account. We must be honest. And the testimony the man in John 9 gave was a very honest, 
factual, accurate testimony. And God is listening to me as I speak here tonight. And I want to say also that the great and grand object in the giving of testimony should always be the glory of God. The glory of God. And I humbly pray as I stand here that I will be empowered and enabled and equipped by God to lift up his name and to lift up his honor. Because what I am, I am by the grace of God. What happened to me, I didn't deserve it. And the journey I'm making uh, to heaven, I don't deserve it. But remember, grace is unmerited and undeserved favor, God's favor to me, who at one time was a poor, hopelessly lost sinner bound for the place of fire and flame. And even as I begin my testimony, my heart is full of praise, full of thanksgiving, full of excitement, full of joy and praise to Jesus. He did it all. He did it all. He did it all for me. And I will be taking what remains of eternity. If such an expression is acceptable, it will take me all eternity to explore and to understand fully what God did in my life. As a teenager sitting in a gospel service in a little mission hall in Ross Lane, known to some of you, um, I was planning to take the little hall to Africa uh, to birth a church in it or to let somebody else do that. But alas, uh, the devil must have heard what I was planning and it got burned down um, in an electrical fire a few years ago. <clears throat> An interesting story um, about my life as a child of a, a few weeks old. My parents were living in Sainfield. Imagine a sinner being born in Sainfield. Can you imagine that? That's why I had to move out so quickly after two or three weeks. <clears throat> but uh, they were moving house. My father was moving to uh, do work. Uh, somewhere else as a farm manager, and um, my two older siblings were there, uh, a sister and a brother, and then myself. And they were moving house, and they'd packed their belongings, and they'd taken the two older children, and um, they were waiting on the side of the road at the end of a long lane, and they'd forgotten about yours truly. I was home alone. I could make my own movie. <clears throat> but I was blissfully unaware of what was going on. But if there had been, there was absolutely no danger whatever. And of course, they couldn't have uh, waited too long before discovering the mistake that they had made that left the child behind. My mother said, Ernie, uh, where's, the, where's the baby? He says, you have the baby. No, I haven't. Have you got the baby? No, the baby was back in the house, in a Moses basket, uh, blissfully fast asleep. But if there had been any danger, I believe that even then the hand of God was on my life. There are no coincidences. There are no accidents with God. I hope you understand that. I was born into a drunkard's home. At least that's what my father became. One of 14, yes, 14 children, seven boys, seven girls, and as I've intimated, I was number three. I think that's a good number, number three. <clears throat> a drunkard's home is not a happy home. Never is, never was, never will be. You never have your sorrows to look for. I remember many a time being manhandled by my father as a young boy and um, being bashed against and into the wall like I were a punching, um, a punching ball. 
I can vividly hear in my head, even tonight as I talk to you, the screams of my mother being viciously beaten by a drunken husband and at a time when she was pregnant. I remember for weeks she could not appear in public because of the awful injuries and awful bruising to her face and head. I remember the old hall stand where we used to hang our coats. There was no place left on it to hang our coats. Every peg was broken because my mother was bashed against it so often. Is that a pleasant part of my history? You'd better believe me when I say no. No, it's very shameful and it's painful. This much I can tell you. There were a group of people in the village of Rosley who had a commitment to pray for our family. When it started, I'm not sure. They prayed for our family. So I'm talking now about a prayer factor that I believe was instrumental in bringing me into the kingdom of God. In fact, in two halls, our needs, our family were covered in prayer. If you never heard it said before, I want to give you the evidence for it that no one enters the kingdom of God that has not been prayed for, interceded for. And that was very much uh, uh, our experience. And I believe what happened in my life, what began to unfold in my life, God was active. God was working. God had us in mind. You say, how do you know it was coincidental? Or it wasn't coincidental? For this reason, my father's uh, younger brother, my uncle uh, Tommy, was on the other side of town uh, farming, and my father was on this side of town. And that family, that other family, were to this day untouched. Untouched. To my knowledge, not any of them are yet in the kingdom of God. I trust I am wrong, but I am not aware of any evidence to indicate otherwise. And there are two families just two miles apart, and one was impacted by the power of God and the other virtually untouched because one family was prayed for. I want you to know that God answers prayer, and if you're not praying for your family, for your neighborhood, you ought to repent tonight, even as the meeting continues. God will hold you accountable. You may not see the evidence right away to your prayer, but God answers prayer. And God wrought in my life powerfully because of prayer. There was the power of prayer evident in my story. And uh, indeed, to this day, that is, that is how I've survived. That is how I've got this far. That is uh, how I, I, I overcome battles and make my way through storms. People pray for me, and I do my own share of uh, pr prayer and, and war spiritual warfare. There's another factor that is relevant, and that is the providences of God, the providential factor. There were at least two or three or four times when I could and should have lost my life but God was watching over me, like the Moses basket story. I remember being involved in an accident with my father who was drunk behind the wheel, and he went over the hedge and into a deep ditch that was full of water. Some of us could have been very badly hurt or killed that evening. I remember another time wading out into deep water, uh, and as boys my age then daring to see how close to the edge you could get without falling in, I stepped over the edge, and there was a powerful current. It was not the current's fault that I wasn't pulled down, down that raging uh, torrent that day. <clears throat> Only quickly I grabbed a hold of a little um, thorn bush. Um, you don't worry about the thorns when your life is at stake. The little bush wasn't any thicker or stronger than what I'm holding on to here, and it could easily have given way but it, it held, it held fast until my brother, seeing my dilemma, rushed, and he grabbed a hold of me and pulled me out. I should have died that day. And there were other instances too. God preserved my life, 
And I'm sure many of you here tonight can tell a similar story, and perhaps even some who are not saved and you're in this meeting. God is good. God is gracious. And when people pray, that makes it more difficult for you uh, to die or to, uh, to, to, to slip out into a lost eternity. We thank God for the power of prayer. As a child, although our home was an ungodly home, no table grace, name of Jesus constantly taken in blasphemy, constant conflict, fighting, all manner of things, um, we still went to children's meetings. Children's meetings, you know, are always an opportunity uh, for, for mother to get her head shard for an hour and a half. I think that might have been the reason why we were sent. And so the gospel hall in the village and also the little Irish evangelistic band hall, we went there to meetings. And now this, to say to my shame and to the credit of those who ran those meetings, I, I should have been hanged uh, by those who were organizing those meetings. I should have been hanged uh, at least after a year or two of such awful torment and awful mischief and rascality. I, 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 I tortured and tormented those uh, people who, who organized those meetings. I did everything I shouldn't have done. Everything and a few extra things too but they were patient with me. I owe such a great debt to people whose names I could mention here tonight. The majority of you would not know them, but God knows I'm grateful. And no doubt they were praying for our family also now that we began to attend those meetings. It was in those meetings I learned John 3 and 16. And when the Word of God gets into your heart, it's always in your heart. I learned that text, I remember vividly, uh, memorizing it and having to say it publicly in the gospel hall. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not go to hell, should not perish, but have everlasting life. I will always, always, always remember that. And then I remember one day standing in our sitting room at home. There wasn't much nice furniture in the room. There is not nice furniture generally in a drunkard's home, certainly back then in the 50s and 60s. But I remember a gospel text that my older brother received as a prize from one of the same Sunday schools, and it said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I remember like it were last evening or yesterday afternoon, I stood and I looked at the picture. I looked at it. I looked at it. Something attracted and attached my attention to the gospel text on the wall, except a man be born again. And it just flashed into my mind that whatever that was, I had not experienced it, it yet. And if I needed that new birth experience to get to the place that was mentioned on the picture, which was heaven, I wasn't going to heaven. It was like an exposition. It was like a shaft of light from heaven into my heart. A boy of 11 standing looking at the Word of God and the Word of God lighting up just like these large lights above my head. And I knew I wasn't right with God. I knew that if I died, I wasn't ready. I knew that I needed something to happen in my life if I was to find Jesus and salvation. I thought about it. Uh, it may seem like I was looking at the picture for five minutes or longer, but it, it might only have been 10 seconds. But so much happened in that space of time. I could never forget that moment. So there was a prayer factor, there was a providential factor, and there was the power of the Word of God factor in my life. And all those are good ingredients that prepare the way and lead uh, a lost soul, at least into the zone of the cross and meeting with Jesus and finding salvation. Even though I didn't have uh, 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 even an infant, infantismal understanding beyond what I've said of the way of salvation. Part of my story is not pleasant. I talk about my home. We never had good clothes to wear. 
uh, always hand-me-downs or second bought second-hand, sometimes no shoes to wear. I remember distinctly having to do work on the farm without shoes on my feet. Um, I say that to say this. I have spent 11 years in, and longer in Africa working, and I have an understanding how the hundreds of thousands and millions of people that live there to this day, and they have no shoes to wear. I understand what it's like for them. The only difference being they, they have a good climate. We did not have a good climate. Uh, they do not have the cold that we had uh, and have in, in our climate. But I have an understanding of poverty. It was a preparation for understanding another culture, even an African one, giving me an empathy. And when I tell some of these people that um, I came from such and such a background and uh, uh, I had no shoes at one time, they say, really? And they're puzzled. They think everybody who lives in the West uh, are veritable millionaires. At least they feel there's no bottom to your pocket or your bank account and that you never were in want. But I said, I understand what want is. I was there at one time. I thank God he kept me alive. I was on the verge of running away from home one time. I wonder what would have happened if I did. There were times when my father was so violent towards me I felt like I would ambush him sometime when I got older and stronger, and I would, I would give him what for because of what he did to my mother. I thank God I never did anything like that. I was a compulsive blasphemer. I blasphemed like a drunken sailor. I wonder how on earth I learned such a vocabulary. I am totally, totally, and deeply ashamed of that although I've been on my way to heaven for 50 years and more now, and been forgiven, I still have a scar. Forgiven, yes, but I still am ashamed. And I hope I'll never forget, or I mean, I'll never cease to be ashamed. It's nothing to be proud of. I was a compulsive liar. Am I proud of that? Absolutely not. You couldn't believe my word if it were to save your life or my life. It was com a compulsion. There was a power in me. There was something that had gripped me. My lifestyle was so wicked and so ungodly. I speak the truth, I lie not. And my heart is shedding tears if my eyes on the front of my face are not. Because I feel it and feel grief for it although it has been covered by the blood of Jesus from the moment I trusted my Savior. I was a compulsive thief. That's another part of my story. I stole everything that was not nailed down. So if I was around, it was a good thing to lock up your valuables or to nail them down or to put them out of my sight. Nothing I ever took that didn't belong to me prospered with me. I remember one time stealing a Bible, and I remember it was a Bible. I remember the circumstances of that. Something, something drew me to possess this thing uh, called the Bible, the Holy Bible. I'll come back to that story in a moment or two. So I was a sinner bound for hell traveling there at the speed of a fast train, a very fast train. If I had not found Jesus Christ when I did, I could well have been there now for a long time before tonight. I was on a course, I was on a collision course with mankind, I was on a collision course with the law, I had run-ins with the police, I was on a collision course with with. With, with God and with all that was right and respectable and righteous. But tonight I'm marveling. I am marveling. I feel like reaching up and touching heaven. I'm marveling in the grace of God. 
Did I not say I'm dealing with absolutes? I met Jesus. More true to say Jesus met with me. I wasn't looking for him. And my life has never been the same. It was the month of March, February and March 1966. And the evangelist Christy Irwin, who is still alive and still preaching and serving God, he was having a mission. He was quite a young man in his early 20s then. And he had a series of meetings that must have lasted for three or four or more weeks. And it was a time of visitation in the village of Rosley. In fact, there was no time like that uh, since. I can't remember before, but since. And the hall was packed every night. And the gospel was spoken with great simplicity. And the meetings were lively, good, powerful, lively singing. And uh, almost every night, people were getting saved. There must have been 15 or 20 or more that found Christ at that time. It was a, like a, a breath of God in a solidly nationalist uh, village and community in such a place as that at that time. I was in a meeting um, that was a gospel mission that was being conducted by... Um, Robert, and um, what's his colleague's name, um, down in, in, in um, Derna Wilt last year, was it? And there was at least four of us there on the one night, all of whom found Christ in that mission. Isn't it so amazing? What God did, it was a solid, and it was a deep work of grace. I remember the night, sitting three seats from the back, on a form, and about half past nine of the clock, the gospel had been preached, and I raised my hand. I'd got that invitation. Now, that was a big thing for me. I may have been all that I, and was all that I was saying to you, but when I was in a crowd of people, I wasn't brave. I wasn't, wasn't brave at all. But um, that night, my hand went up, and um, when everybody else had left, um, just the preacher and myself, I bowed my head, and with the deepest sincerity, with the utmost seriousness and determination, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. Did I understand everything? No. I understood very little. But what I did, I meant it. I meant it. I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and to forgive my sins and to make me his child. I suppose it was the first prayer I had ever, ever, ever prayed. But if ever I meant anything I ever did, I meant that piece of business and work that night, 50 years ago, on the 2nd of March past. My sister, who's now deceased, younger than I, she died at age 20 from a cerebral tumor. She stayed behind that night too and gave her life to Christ. And remember as we walked a mile and a half into the country to where we lived, we talked about heaven and being heaven and going, being in heaven and going to heaven the whole night, the whole journey through. I remember that distinctly. And when I got home, my parents were sitting in the sitting room. Our house was being renovated, so they were in the sitting room. They would never sit in a sitting room um, on a night like that, but uh, the other place was uh, being, as I've said, worked on. So I marched into the sitting room. My mother was sitting here uh, on my right-hand side, and my father was sitting over there. And I announced to them that I had got saved, that I'd given my life to Jesus Christ. Now, that was a quantum leap for me to confess Christ in that manner uh, to my family who were ungodly and did not seem to understand the language. I said, I've given my life to Jesus Christ, and they never said a cheaper. They were hoping secretly that it was true because they could do nothing with me. 
Everybody who knew me feared for my future. I don't say that with any sense of any sense of being proud of it. I feel totally ashamed. They were hoping that there was some truth in it or that it would stick. I turned around and I went up the stairs and I began a search. What on earth was I searching for on a night like that? I was searching for a copy of the Word of God. I had been told to read the Bible every day. Good advice. So I searched. I don't know how long I searched. 10, 15 minutes. I found the Bible, found the Word of God. And with the Word of God open, I, I set it on the side of my bed and I got down on my knees. And I began to pray. And I called God Father. I was just a child of God for 40 minutes at that stage. I'd given my life to Christ, talked about heaven all the way home, confessed Christ to my parents. Now I've found a Bible and I'm on my knees praying. It could have been said of me as it was said of Paul, behold, he prayeth. And when you get real salvation, it leads you to do those things. The Word of God becomes a major book in your life, and prayer becomes a major exercise in your life. And if that's not the case, at least after a period of time, there's something wrong somewhere. Something wrong somewhere. And so I prayed, and I thanked God for saving me, and I read some verses from His Word. And the next morning, I got up and I repeated that exercise. Prayed and read the Scriptures and asked God to keep His hand upon me. I, I did not know anything about prayer at that time. And then I traveled um, on a bus to school in Lisliski. I was still attending school. I was one month from my 14th birthday, although it seemed I'd lived a long life before that time because I seemed to have uh, done so much. And when the roll was being called, as they called it back then, there were 40 in the class, and my teacher, when he came to my name, he stopped. And he said, Edgerton, he said, uh, is it true that you have got saved? This man knew a little bit about the gospel. I said, Mr. McWake, it's absolutely true. I've got saved. He must have been an opportunist because he followed that up quickly with a second question. He says, Edgerton, does that mean I'm going to have no more trouble with you? And I said, sir, that's exactly what it means. The poor man, he would have needed danger money to have me in his class. I never learned a thing, and I kept the entire class in turmoil for as long as I was there. Am I proud of that? I'm absolutely ashamed, not least for my own purposes, ashamed. I had been called out in front of the class to make this statement, and I had been nailed to the wall in a surprise um, public spectacle, giving testimony to everybody there that I was now on the Lord's side. So 40, 39 pair of eyes, 40 including teacher, their eyes were on me. And it's good to be put on the line at the very beginning. Now, I was never, never, never in trouble again in school. Never in trouble ever again. And I went back some years later, and the teacher announced to the class, this young man, he used to be um, impossible, not just difficult, but impossible, would not learn. And then something happened. A miracle happened, she said. That's as far as she went. And I butted in. I said, excuse me, but uh, God wrought the miracle. I met Jesus. And he transformed my life. And um, for years and years, people remembered the miracle that happened in my life at that time. Began to attend a prayer meeting. In fact, I began to attend three prayer meetings, one of which I cycled 14 miles to every, every Thursday evening in, in a place called Dromedy. Um, Bertie would know the place, I'm sure. But the grace of God has been marvelous. I used to take myself to the woods and pray. And I would pray at the top of my voice. I didn't think anybody heard me, but my mother and my father 
heard me, and they used to complain terribly that I was astray in the head, that I had, uh, I was doing something that was not acceptable. I was a little bit embarrassed that people heard me praying. But there was not a field or a corner of a field. There was not an office house or the corner of a buyer or barn around our yard that I had not bent the knee many, many times and wept and prayed with the tears coming down my face. I wish there were as many tears now as then. I wish, I wish. My sister Sandra saw those tears on one occasion accidentally, and it was the means, at least partly the means, of bringing her to Christ. She knew that I was praying for her and for our family to get saved. Since that time, my father got saved, powerfully saved. He's in heaven now nine years, but it was a miracle. I prayed that God would save him and give him at least seven good years. I was thinking about the um, good years that Joseph had in, in Egypt before the seven bad years. Seven good years to establish a testimony. The Lord gave him eight years and uh, he got real salvation. My mother got saved before that, and uh, some of my brothers and sisters found Christ as well. But they're not all in yet, not all in yet. And if there's one reason I would pray for the coming of Christ to tarry just a little longer, it would be that all the others would get in too. I was a serious Christian. Anything I ever did, I put 100% into it. I should say this to you, the day I met Jesus Christ, I fell in love with Him. I fell in love with Him. I wanted to be like Him. I wanted to live my life singularly to please Him. I speak in His presence as well as yours. I wanted to be holy. I wanted my heart to be clean, as clean as the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary could make it. Anything wrong with that? Is it biblical? Absolutely. I had the nature of Jesus within me, leading me to pray in that manner. And I also had a desire to preach. Now, I had no understanding what all this meant. I, I felt a sense of call from heaven, uh, a sense of constraint on me that one day I'd be a preacher of the gospel. I never thought that would lead me um, and take me on the journey that I've been on now these past 46 or 47 years. Uh, evangelism, uh, pastoral ministry, and now in Africa. But the seeds had been sown by the Holy Ghost at that time. I repeat, there are no coincidences, no accidents. There's no afterthoughts with God. He knows what he's doing, and he had his hand on my life. I remember the time, one of those episodes when I should have been swept away to my death. My mother said, God must have a plan for your life. And she wasn't saved wasn't saved. God must have a plan, she said, for your life. And he had. And he has a plan for your life too. The matter to do with restitution, God exercised me about that. I used to hear people preaching on restitution. I said, what on earth is that? What kind of animal is that? Restitution? I didn't know what it meant. And over a period of time, God showed to me that it was about putting right the wrongs in your past life, because the Scriptures declare God requireth that which is past. When you get saved, God does not hand you down a big bunch of receipts. I'm quoting W.P. Nicholson when I say that. What you can uncover, Calvary will not cover. You need to pay up. You need to sort out bad business, no matter what it costs you. I reached a point, and I said, Lord, I understand now what you're asking of me, and it's going to be very difficult for me. But I said, Lord, I'm ready. I love you, and I'm ready to do it. 
I said, Lord, I have no money, but I have a few possessions. And I presented a pair of football boots to Jesus. Imagine. Was he interested in my football boots? Yes, he was. A watch and a wallet. Was he interested in those things? Yes, he was interested in all of those things. And whatever else I can't remember, I said, Lord, this is, these are my earthly possessions. And I'm now consecrating them to you. I want to sell them, and I'll begin to make restitution. And I did. And at that time, for no, well, I say for, uh, I can't understand the reason why, but my gra- I do understand the reason, really. Uh, God spoke to my grandfather, uh, who was an old man, and he, he told me he wanted to talk to me. And he says, Gilbert, he said, from today on, he says, I want to give you a pound out of my uh, pension every week. Imagine. Whatever made him de- decide on such a thing if it wasn't the Holy Spirit. And I saved, I saved, I saved every penny I could get. And for three years, I began to traverse the countryside and make journeys of 50 miles on a bicycle over the mountain to restore things I'd stolen from people. It was a slow, tedious, and it was a painful exercise. When I'd put some things right, God would reveal more. When I put those right, God revealed more. I wondered, would it ever end? Would it ever end? And there were some things I couldn't put right because I didn't know who was involved. And so I told the Lord I would give conscious money to a good cause, and I did. And I reached a point where I could look up to heaven and say, now, Jesus, I have done what you've told me to do. There's nothing now between you and me. And God bore witness in my heart that was how it was. Are you hearing me? This was between me and God. Nobody except the persons concerned knew anything about what was going on or why. But God was taking a dealing with me. I did not realize, as I have said, I would become a minister of the gospel and I would have to, I would have to expound this book and talk about Zacchaeus and explain why Zacchaeus wanted to pay fourfold um, by way of restitution to those whom he had wronged and uh, other people who had matters like that to attend to. God requires that which is past. Should it cost you your home, a farm of land? Should it cost you your reputation? God will hold you to it. But I want to tell you the will of God and heaven and the peace of God now It's worth it. It's worth it, for sure. It was at that time I had been ill and had been attending the doctor for some months. I had um, a serious problem with um, extremely severe headaches that were causing um, violent sickness. It reached a point where I could hardly travel on the school bus. And I remember I'd been sent to the hospital, and the consultant had said to me, uh, sorry, nothing we can do. You'd best go home and, and make, make the most of it. And I remember coming home in the ambulance and thinking to myself, in fact, I wasn't thinking to myself, God was speaking to me, and God said to me, you've tried everybody and everything, but you've never prayed, you've never asked me. I can do for you, he said, what uh, doctors can't do for you. And I felt so, uh, just a young Christian of two years, I felt so rebuked. I've tried everybody, but I haven't, I haven't prayed. It never occurred to me. I never thought Jesus could do that. But I remember looking at a book uh, around or about the same time, and on the front of the book there was a a text which said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And that verse seemed to stick uh, in my memory. And I remember rushing into the house that evening and running up the stairs and getting down on my knees, and the text came immediately to my mind, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And before my knees hit the ground, I was wonderfully and powerfully and instantly healed. I've never suffered from that condition from that day to this. 45, uh, 47, 48 years. God touched me. I know it. I know it. I know it. He's a wonderful Savior. 
during those uh, years, my heart was hungering for a deeper experience with God. I didn't want to miss anything, anything that God had for me. I wanted the Lord to have all that there was of me. And many meetings I stood up in where a message on consecration or surrender was being preached. And I remember consecrating my life. Many a time in the private place I would cast myself down in my utter entirety at the feet of Jesus. And I meant it. I meant it. I meant it. I had no plans for my own life. I wanted His. I wanted my heart to be clean and free from the defilements of sin. I wanted to be a, a holy man of God. And I want to say here tonight, uh, uh, no one can preach a holy life, a holy walk, unless one is living such a life and walking such a walk. And I longed for the power of the Holy Ghost in my life, like the disciples had it. And I'm of the persuasion that Pentecost is perpetuated, that the fullness of the Spirit is for all believers. And there was a day in my life when God met with me, and He baptized me with divine fire and a heavenly anointing. I repeat, I am what I am today, serving God in the capacity that I've been called to serve because of that moment. I could not do the work that I've been doing these many, many years. I could not have carried the load, preached the sermons, and, and worked through the program I've been working through if there wasn't and had not been a special gifting and anointing from heaven upon my life. I give God praise. I've God, given God praise. I told you that a testimony is personal. Um, this is my story, my story. This is my unique and uh, my own experience of God. I, I, I tell it to you like it is. It has not been made up. In the mix of that surrender um, to God, and alongside what I told you had come through to me when I was a young believer, and just indeed saved a few days, the sense of call, God calling from heaven, claiming my life for service. I told the Lord I'm ready to go anywhere, at any time, at any cost. But I couldn't go anywhere until God gave me the liberty, until God give me permission. And so, one evening after coming home from a prayer meeting, I've intimated the moment to you at the beginning. I was dropped off at my, the end of my lane. I came up into the house. The house was in darkness. Everybody had gone to bed because it was 11 o'clock, and the fire was out, and I knelt down beside an old kitchen chair beside the Rayburn stove, and I opened the Bible, opened the Word of God. And it opened at the place I'd been reading from that morning. I'd read chapter 12 in uh, the book of Genesis. And for some reason, I felt I need to go back to my morning reading, and I need to read that story about Abraham again. And so opening the Word of God at chapter 12 and verse number 1, and it was as if the Holy Spirit took this portion of the Word of God and put a big light on it and held it up in front of me, saying to me, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee off. And I will bless thee and make thee a blessing. Now, let me tell you, dear people, I could not be more sure, more powerfully or clearly convinced that God had called me into the ministry. 
from that portion. I could not be more sure. I bowed my heart immediately in tears, and I said, Lord, I hear you. I said, my heart is saying, Amen. I'm ready, Lord. I'll go anywhere. But then I said, Lord, I know the road in front of me is not going to be easy, so I'm going to ask you uh, to give me another seal, another confirmation, not doubting anything. I said, Lord, would it please you to seal your call upon my life again? I said, I'd be so happy if you would speak one more time. And I don't recommend at all opening the Scriptures at random, but I knew no better back then. I just opened the Word of God, and the Word of God opened up at Psalm number 71, and I read these verses. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the number thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine own lane. I said, dear Jesus, I thank you so much. Your word is powerful, beautiful. You've spoken again. But again, I know, I said, I know the road's going to be hard. I'm the only believer in this house, this family, and my father has other plans, and uh, I need to be sure, and I, not for now, but for later on, I said, Lord, I'm putting out another fleece. I'm not a person that does that. I, I don't even remember when last I put a fleece out before God. In fact, I may not ever have put more than one or two fleeces out in my entire life. I said, Lord, I want another confirmation. I said, Lord, I'm asking for this third seal from heaven on your call on my life. I said, Lord, give me one soul before the summer holidays at school. Let me lead one soul to Jesus as a confirmation and I closed my interview with God uh, at that time. And next day, going back to school, I was speaking to a friend uh, whom I'd been witnessing to, and he came to me and he says, Gilbert, you've been sharing God's word with me, and I want you to know I've given my life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I've got saved. I remember I was standing in the science room um, in around when he shared that information with me. I felt, ah, oh, hallelujah, that's the seal, that's the confirmation. This is the one soul before the, the holidays. And I remember not long after that, I'd written to a friend and intimated to him, God has called me into the faith mission. And uh, he wrote back to me and he says, I, I bless God, I praise God, um, for your intimation to me that you've been called into the FM, abbreviated faith mission. And something happened that never happened before or since. My mother got the letter, and she read it. Now, she never did that before. And she read this information about going somewhere, being called somewhere, FM, is he going to the foreign mission field or something? And so she told everybody in the house, and my father heard it, and he was raging, absolutely raging. And he did everything for 18 months, but strike me with his fist to the ground. He was so raging, so angry, offered me money, offered me uh, uh, all sorts of propositions, but I said, Father, no thank you, no thank you. I said, I have been called, and I'm going. And he would get so threatening, and he was a man used to fisticuffs, and he would, he never was permitted to touch me. And when the morning came for me to leave to go to Edinburgh, he never got up to say goodbye. But a short while after I had left, when he heard people talking about how 
honored he must be to have a Catholic community. Somebody, it was like as if I had gone into the priesthood or something, and they were saying it was a wonderful, a wonderful uh, privilege for your family. His attitude completely, completely changed. But I held fast, and I was determined. And I thank God for those years of preparation in the Faith Mission Bible College that laid a foundation for my theological future. I've been a theologian or studying theology for the last um, 48 years, and I continue to do so and teach it and preach um, at all levels. But that was where the foundation was laid. I owe a great debt to the faith mission. I was there when Duncan Campbell died. I had nothing to do with his death, but I was so blessed to be in meetings where a man whom God had used in revival, in fact, a number of men whom God had used in revival, um, were there teaching and ministering the Word of God. So, my dear brothers and sisters, that's my story. The call of God came uh, to evangelize throughout England, first of all Scotland, then England, and then the Irish Republic, and then the north of Ireland. For five years I traveled around the province. I traveled around the United Kingdom. And I thank God for those whom I led to Jesus Christ. The numbers were not large, but they're still standing and holding true to God. And some have already beat me a race to the celestial gates. Hallelujah. And then so clearly and distinctly the call of God came on my life to move in a different direction. At this stage, I was engaged to be married to Margaret, my wonderful helpmeet and partner in ministry, my dear wife. And God so clearly through His Word spoke to me again. I remember praying for guidance about this. Lord, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go to Africa, where she had been serving? Do you want me to remain in faith mission and my wife joins me there? Or do you want me to move into, and this is where I was feeling the drawing of God, into a settled ministry in a pastoral capacity. I said, Lord, you have to show me. But the Word of God came so clearly to me from the book of Habakkuk. The vision is yet for an appointed time, though it tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come. And when it comes, it will, it will not lie. I said, thank you, Lord. I'm, winning, I'm willing to wait your time. And so I waited upon God for some months. And then God showed me very, very clearly that he wanted me to change the nature of my ministry from what I'd been doing to pastoral ministry. And as I was reading from Acts uh, chapter 16, um, I read amazing words, and that's okay. God bless you, my dear brother, Clarence. The Word of God came to me from Act 16 in this way. When Paul had seen the vision, we endeavored to go, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. When he had seen the vision, we, plural, endeavored to go. So I knew that I was in the plan of God. And for 28 years, we have served God in pastoral ministry, some very valuable, others very costly, some very trying experiences, all of which have furnished me and equipped me and prepared me for the work that I'm now doing in Africa all of which the joy seasons and the victories as well as the, 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 the trials and all the negative uh, testings and experiences. I never expected to be in Africa. Never, 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 never. That's a long time. Never expected to be in Africa. I sometimes say I'm not a reluctant missionary, but I'm a surprised missionary. And in my mid-50s, the call of God came to me very powerfully 
I went to Africa in 2002 to um, serve God for a while as a thanksgiving for our 25 years of happy marriage and to see my wife's old mission station. And I came and went, and what an experience we had. But I had no desire or leading to return. But when I did return two years later in 2004, preaching a sermon to a group of pastors in Nairobi, through my own sermon, God spoke into my life. I was preaching on the subject, spiritual giants in the Antioch church from Acts 13 and the verse number 2. When he had seen the vision, in, when he had seen, not I'm mixing up my, my two verses, it said as they fasted and as they prayed, the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I had called them. I'm standing in front of a congregation. There's a tall Maasai man here interpreting in Swahili as I speak, and I'm, 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 I'm really fired up with my message, and the people are drinking in the Word of God, but the Word is not for them, it's for me. And God spoke to me and said to me, I want you to come back here and to do this for the rest of your life. I'm commissioning you to teach the teachers and to lead the leaders and to pastor the pastors. I said, I'm dealing with absolutes. I am as sure of the call of God to Africa as I know my name and as I'm married to that lovely girl sitting down beside Pat. Are you hearing me? I dare not take a move to the right hand or to the left hand unless I'm absolutely sure that God has spoken to me. In fact, when I shared with my wife that day, going home, I said, Margaret, I said, I believe God is preparing us for a change. And she looked at me and she laughed. <laughs> she says, I know. God has spoken to me, but I knew it was no use talking to you because you wouldn't listen to me. You would have to hear it directly from heaven. Well, I heard it directly from heaven. And these last 11 years of our lives in Africa, they comprise a chapter that I never, 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 never would have wanted to have missed. I have seen the face of Jesus. I have seen the, the wind of God blowing in Africa. And even over these last months in Africa, we have seen the power of God in an amazing fashion. I guess over these last 11 years, we've seen 40 or 50,000 people responding to the Word of God. And in these last three months, we have seen over, well, well over 1,200 people coming to Christ. And hundreds and thousands of believers broken, broken, broken down in a deep, deep repentance, weeping, until someone had to come with a mop and wipe the floor. We're building a kingdom that will last forever. And I feel so humbled to be allowed to share a small part in building such a kingdom. I want to ask you now, before I pray, how are you faring in the range of absolutes of which I've been speaking? Are you saved? Are you 100% absolutely sure that you are rightly related to God? Are you? Are you? And tell me, what about the business of restitution? Maybe you were hoping I wouldn't mention it again, but I am. Are you in the clear with God are you in the clear with God? Are you in debt? Is there unfinished business? Phone call or an email? Or a text message? Or a visit you need to pay somewhere? Is there something you need to sort out in your past? Tell God tonight you're willing, you're ready. You'll do it. If not, before you go to bed tonight, you'll do it the first opportunity you get tomorrow. 
And if you're here and you're suffering from physical sickness, I want you to know God really does heal. I'm not in the category or the camp of those who believed that miracles stopped with the death of the last apostle. I, I am not in that camp because I have read in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can do today what he did yesterday. I hope you're in the same camp as I am. He can heal this, a sick body. And I want to tell you that you need, and it's your birthright inheritance, to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't be making any excuses. It's not for ministers and missionaries, preachers and evangelists. It's for every believer. Every believer. There were some in that upper room on the day of Pentecost, and they never preached. There were ladies as well as men. They all needed the same fullness of God. I call you to seek God. And it may be that there's somebody here and God's laying his hand on you for ministry. Uh, maybe as an evangelist, maybe as a missionary, if not in Africa, somewhere else, maybe in the Irish Republic, maybe even somewhere in England because it's a heathen country. I'm saying to you, whatever God wants you to do, remember his callings are accompanied by his enablings, and he will provide for you, and he will equip you. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. I invite you now to stand, please, and we pray. Gracious Father, we have felt the atmosphere of another world in this meeting tonight. Your people have been praying. And I feel that during the course of the meeting that the Holy Spirit has been hovering over the meeting. The angels have been all around this building. Jesus has been in the house. I ask you, Lord, to bless the humble account of your workings in my life that I've tried my level best to report to the people here this evening. I pray that you will get all the glory, all the honor and the praise, because it is your work in my life. I'm not capable of it myself. And I pray that you would imprint the truth, the truth of Bible experience and the work of the Spirit in a life imprint these things on the lives of the people tonight in this house. I thank you for everybody in the meeting. Thank you for the young people. I pray that they'll not feel too tired or kept up too late uh, with uh, school and the prospect tomorrow. I pray that none will complain, but I pray that each one will be able to say, God spoke to me. God spoke to me. God touched me. I heard, I heard a voice from heaven in this house tonight. Bless what has been shared, gracious Father. And do bless our time now around the uh, tea table in the adjoining room. Bless the refreshments to us and bless our fellowship together. And I pray that our time would be hallowed, hallowed, and that it might be profitable and it might be a continuation of the meeting. Bless uh, our dear brother Bertie and his ministry in this house, and his wife Pat and their family. Thank you for our brother Dean and other men who are in this congregation upon whom the hand of God is, like uh, our brother Robert. I pray that you would raise up a, a team of preachers and, and evangelists and ministers, the like of which have never been found in any one church anywhere else. So bless your word and your work, Lord, and keep your hand upon it and upon all of us in the days that lie ahead. We know we're very close, very, very close to the coming again of our Lord Jesus. And we want, we want not only to be ready ourselves, but we want to help to get the bride ready and prepared for that great climatic event. We give you thanks and pray for your 
dismissal and for your grace upon our lives tonight and tomorrow and throughout the incoming week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.